What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. So ever since The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom released, it's been absolutely crushing sales charts. Nintendo most recently giving us the update that has shipped over 18 and a half million copies. But now some controversy is popping up online with discussion around some recently discovered patents. And we'll go over all of that here today. Also, we are gonna be talking about Sony and their recent financials for the PlayStation 5 even coming in a little bit under expectations as well as some leaks around their plans for the future with this fiscal year, showing them going all in on streaming. Oh, and we also have the a new best rated game of the year that actually jumped over the Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom to get there. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure that like button helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And we're gonna start today with Dino Crisis and Capcom. People have been asking Capcom if they can do something with Dino Crisis. You see the RE engine, you look over at Dino Crisis, Seems like it makes a lot of sense, right? Especially with all of the Resident Evil remakes that they've been doing. Well, it sounds like Capcom is ready to deliver some new Dino Crisis content in Exo Primal. And this was during an interview. We can see this posted up over on Silicon Era with the director for Exo Primal, where they ask if they can see Dino Crisis content come to Exo Primal. They say Leviathan is the type of entity that will go to any means to collect a variety of useful, Combat data. If there's enough demand from players, Leviathan will, will very well could make this a uh, reality. So probably now people were hoping to hear when Dino Crisis comes up in conversation with Capcom, but it's what they're doing with Exo Primal. That's their big focus right now. And uh, I, I do wonder if as long as they're focusing on Exo Primal, if there is a place for Dino Crisis. But hey, look on the bright side. If you're really in Exo Primal, it sounds like they want to do a collaboration with Dino Crisis content. They are doing some interesting crossovers with Street Fighter being one of them, so I guess at this point, why not Dino Crisis? Also, after the most recent re-reveal of Avowed, people noticed that it looked different from the original trailer that announced the entire game in the first place. And yeah, it turns out Avowed has gone through many changes in the background, one of which had to do if it was gonna be a single player game at all. This is posted up and transcribed over on uh, Games Radar. This from the studio head at Obsidian saying, one of the things where I really pushed was that Avowed was going to be multiplayer. And this, this makes sense when they explain the idea being, well, we're going to ask for tens of millions of dollars, sometimes upwards of $80 million from publisher to build a game. And it's easier to say, oh, it also has this multiplayer component to it, but they decided not to go that route, instead focusing in on what you would expect from Obsidian, a really good single player RPG. They say after working on it for a little bit, we realized that we weren't focused on the things that we're best at. So we made a pivot on the game basically to refocus really and make sure that it was at the end of the day, an Obsidian game and not something different. And this is good to hear because yes, it is easier to pitch something to a publisher when you have updates and microtransactions, other things you can attach to it. But in this case for Obsidian, probably be like trying to take a, a square peg and put it into a round hole. Just, just let Obsidian do what they do best and make a really good single player RPG. And seems like that's what Avowed is shaping up to be. So I'm excited to see more about this, of course, as we get closer and closer to it eventually coming out. Oh, and we did have a pretty cool announcement for all of you retro gaming fans out there. This for the PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 console. And you can see this here. This is the retro receiver from 8-Bit Doe. And as you can see, it's a little dongle that plugs into your PlayStation one or PlayStation 2. And the idea is it'll allow you to sync all kinds of modern controllers to your system. So the uh, DualShock 4, the DualSense, the DualSense Edge, a bunch of Xbox controllers, the One uh, Series, the Elite controllers, the Wii U Pro, the Switch Pro controllers, then a host of other things like different arcade sticks and stuff. So it really opens up the options you have for your PlayStation 1 or your PlayStation 2. It is available now over on the 8 Doe website and coming in at a price of $25. It's not too bad considering the limited options you may have now at this point when it comes to Sony first party controllers for the PS1 and the PS2, at least this opens it up to some of their newer ones, the DualShock and the DualSense. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom and some controversy that's popped up online around recently discovered patents. Now, it's not new for a company who develops games or even hardware to patent the different things that they've created, right? Whether it's mechanics and games or, really just pieces of hardware they create and how those pieces of hardware 
function in the first place. But there are some concerns now as we go forward and more and more patents are filed as to the effect that it will have on just overall creativity in gaming. So, for example, we can see this posted up, really got things started online. This was from Automaton Media. And in this instance, they spotted then the period between July 10th and August 4th, Tendo made public a total of 32 patents, 31 of which seemed related to Tears of the Kingdom. Now, the fact they made them public means that they, of course, had them filed previously. And this is something that happened on the buildup to Tears of the Kingdom. People were spotting different patents that were made public and trying to figure out if it was maybe a game mechanic that we can look forward to, right? Same thing happens with hardware and new controllers and other things that Nintendo may be working on uh, in the background. But the, one of the big issues, as I mentioned, is that this can actually block many ideas that companies and even smaller developers especially have. So they said it was found that Nintendo's patents had been cited as ground for rejection of other companies' patents in 180 different cases during the year 2022. And remember, that's just Nintendo. While they are very aggressive in the courtroom and all these different things, I mean, patents are patents. You file them, people encroach on it, it can be rejected. And 180 cases just for Nintendo. Now think about all the other large publishers out there who file different patents. It, it adds up very, very quickly. Now, if you take a look at some of the patents, there are many images that were shared over on Automaton, and I'll leave this course link down below in the sources. A lot of it has to do with the mechanics in Tears of the Kingdom that makes it very unique from other games. So like Ultra Hand, for example, has a lot of focus and ways that Ultra Hand works in accordance with the world around Link and stuff and Fuse being another one. The, there was one strange one that I, I think a lot of people looked at and tried to figure out, is this too broad of a of a mechanic to patent? That had to do with the load screen, specifically transition from one map to the other and what's even shown on the load screen. And the thing with patents, it's, uh, it's really hard to know how it will affect things going forward until it starts to affect things. So one really good example is this patent right here. This simply says game display method, moving direction indicating method, game apparatus and drive simulating apparatus. Now, this is a very well-known patent that was made a long time ago. It was made by Sega, all right? And this, believe it or not, is the arrow above your character when you're driving around in something like Crazy Taxi. Now, just a couple of years later, there was like Simpsons, what, Hit and Run and, and all this, and they tried to use uh, basically an arrow kind of above your character. It was a whole thing in court. There was a settlement outside of it, but it sort of shows you the effect that something as simple as an arrow above a character's head when you're driving that you wouldn't even think about can uh, can can cause when it comes to this sort of thing. And then we hear about how the Nemesis system was finally patented by uh, WB. There was a lot of general generalization they had in there. They had to fix some of the language. The idea is, yes, there are mechanics that you can patent, but it has to be very specific wording so that you're not trying to patent a very broad topic or mechanic in that case. So it, I get the controversy, I get the argument back and forth about this, but based on some of the stuff that Nintendo had, the only one that I looked at a bit sideways was the loading screen. Everything else is like Ultra Hand, if Link is doing this without any kind of physics and very specific stuff, but also, very common stuff, unfortunately, in gaming. So hopefully it doesn't trip up too much stuff when it comes to your creativity well, going forward in the next like decade or so. Next up, let's talk about PlayStation Plus games for the month of August, and this would cover the extra and premium tiers. These games will be going live August 15th minus one title, but let's head over here to PlayStation Blog and we'll go through the different games. Starting at the top with Sea of Stars. This game will be going in later on August 29th because that's the day it comes out. So this is a day one release in the PlayStation Plus Extra and Premium, as well as Xbox Game Pass. So this is the first game, I think, that is releasing day one on both services. So shout out to the developers there. They managed to get two bags then. And this is a, an old school turn-based RPG. So definitely check it out if you're a fan of, of that genre. Then we have Moving Out 2, Destiny 2 The Witch Queen, Lost Judgment, Destroy All Humans 2 Reprobed, Two Point Hospital Jumbo Edition, Source of Madness, Curse to Golf, Dreams, PJ Mass, Heroes of the Night, Hotel Transylvania, Lawn Mowing Simulator, Spell Force 3 Reforced, and Midnight Fight Express. Then we do have the PlayStation Premium games. These are classics and looks like they're all PSP titles this month. So we have Medieval Resurrection, Ape Escape on the Loose, 
and Pursuit Force Extreme Justice. That's kind of fun for Pursuit, Pursuit Force, but I mean, Medieval Resurrection is good, so is Apescape. So not a bad collection of classic games and pretty good setup for extra and premium, especially with Sea of Stars going in day one. So a lot of content there. I would still like to see a bit of a focus on PS2 games for PlayStation Plus Premium. I uh, haven't really seen that kind of an effort made yet, but PSP games, awesome to see those going in. So not too bad of a month overall, and I will definitely be checking out Sea of Stars when it drops in the service August 29th. Next up, let's talk about Sony's financials with their latest report that they released, and this covers the months of April, May, and June, that being their first quarter of this fiscal year. And there are a lot of questions around this fiscal year for Sony when it comes to their PlayStation division, mostly because they're forecasting 25 million PS5 selling, which would be the most they've ever done for any console in Sony's history in a fiscal year. That being even the PS2, the original PlayStation, PS4, all of it. Well, let's take a look here. This is a chart that they did post up, again, giving a quick rundown of some of the numbers. And I mean, they have uh, the charts and stuff here you can see for Q1, they were up in terms of sales 28%, whereas their operating income you can see had, had a 7% decrease. And they do talk a bit about some of the forecasts and some of the issues they ran into, right? And that's what you see on a lot of these different reports. They have like pluses and then minuses. And one that was pointed out is interesting because it has impact of changes in the launch dates of a portion of first party titles. As in, we've had delays internally for different games. And I don't think it's gonna shock anyone who's been paying attention as of course, we've had reports around things like Last of Us Factions, how, well, it seemed like they were gearing up for a 2023 launch, or at least uh, in this fiscal year, right? That running until the end of March next year. But we then had that report saying that Bungie looked at it and kind of shelved it. So that's, I guess, not coming up anytime soon. We hear about Deviation Games, how it almost appears that Sony cut contracts with them and they had to lay off a whole bunch of their employees there. So it does seem like there is some, some issues going on within Sony when it comes to launch dates of some of their first party titles, but that does happen quite often across the board at most studios. However, this was enough to where they felt the need to actually mention it to investors. Now we can take a look at the hardware software unit sales that they showcased here, and you can see Q1 at 3.3 million systems sold was a pretty clear jump over 2.4 from last year's quarter one. The only issue we're running into, and this is one of the reasons it's it, their stock is falling and all these different things right now is because I, you got to have a pretty good run over the next three quarters to get to 25 million PlayStation 5 consoles sold. And it does, it's bringing up questions around how they're going to get there and if they'll be able to, because as soon as you start lowering your forecast, and especially when it comes to number of units that you can move in a year, it doesn't look great. So now it, people are wondering, have they set the bar too high for themselves to get to that 25 million? Well, they have Spider-Man 2 coming up. So that, that should help to move systems pretty well. I, I would say definitely for the holiday season. And most likely they're gonna launch a PlayStation 5 revision that I'm sure they'll, they'll be able to push as here's the, like the brand new PS5 system. And they'll probably start pushing it at that 399 price as like, this is the baseline one. This is the only one we're selling. And if you want the disc drive, you just buy it separate. That, that's an accessory. It's like buying another controller, right? But that's the biggest thing to keep an eye on here. I, I think Sony's gonna do fine when it comes to the software side because they do really well with third-party sales. And Spider-Man 2 is gonna do really, really well this holiday season. I don't think anyone's questioning that. But there is something else that's come up here and worth keeping an eye on with uh, Project Q in the wings right now. And that has to do with the PlayStation 5 and Sony streaming side of things with games. Of course, we know that Sony is sending out beta codes and different things for people to try out the streaming service that apparently works up to 4K, but it appears they're even more serious than we originally thought with all this. And this comes way of a report from Insider Gaming, you can see here, and this details, uh, apparently their Project Kronos cloud streaming for the PlayStation 5. And this is something apparently that they have been developing in the background for about five years right now due to, according to Insider Gaming, complexity surrounding the PS5's 
SSD. Of course, the PS5 the SSD is very, very fast, and they want to make sure, I, I guess, that the latency and the servers and data centers are all set up to handle that, especially in games. We assume as they get further into the generation, we'll be leveraging that more and more. But according to them, the final product is a custom storage server under the codename Cura, which reads up to five gigabytes a second with less than one milliseconds latency. Now they will have a total of 28 data centers across 15 metros for the PS5 cloud streaming rollout with its plans to fully launch the feature fiscal year 23, which we're in right now. In fact, the latest they would launch this then according to this report would be March 2024. And I mentioned Project Q for a reason, because while we're right now looking at it as a remote play device, if it, as we assume, it's gonna be a, a, a stripped down Android tablet, maybe we get to a point where Sony opens it up for you to not necessarily need a PlayStation 5 to play these games, which, yeah, is what Microsoft's technically been doing this entire time with xCloud. But I will admit, I, I'm curious how Sony is going to handle this in the future because they are very hardware first and really push their consoles with the native experience in the living room with the nice Sony TV and the nice Sony sound system and, and all of this to really start to embrace streaming where the PS5 box isn't necessarily required is uh, an interesting one for Sony. But first we have to see how the streaming performs with their different games. And while they're in beta now, I'll be really curious when they roll it out to all the different people out there who currently have PS5s, because apparently that's the only way you can really do this now. But eventually to people out there who don't have a PS5, you play on your PC, your phone, or maybe that Project Q device. So interesting times ahead for Sony. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about Baldur's Gate 3. It's a game that's been on fire recently, whether it's sales and having hundreds of thousands of concurrent players at any given time on Steam to some of the reviews that continue to pile in with perfect scores. Now I do want to admit, there's only like 14 reviews for this game right now, but as more come in, it, it's actually not falling in for the score. It's actually going up. In fact, if you take a look at the best rated games right now over on Metacritic, it's at the top. You can see it's a 97 currently. And yes, that is one point above The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Now, it, it's very important to note that Baldur's Gate 3 has 14 reviews. The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom has 145 reviews. So I obviously a 96 out of 145 reviews. Yeah, it's a bit more impressive on that front because you assume as scores come in, opinions will vary and differ and you'll get some lower scores and that could bring the overall Metacritic down. But right now, Baldur's Gate 3 sitting at the top. And do I have to say it again? This is this might end up being the best year in gaming. I mean, look at how many games we already have sitting in the 90s for average score on Metacritic. There's a whole bunch of other games still to come that are probably gonna be really good. So, hey, 2023, just keeps on going. I wouldn't have even thought that Baldur's Gate 3 would be in the situation that it is with all these people playing the sales through the roof. It's not just me. Apparently the community manager said, I told them maybe 100,000 people prepare for that for concurrent player count. How about 800,000 the other day? 97 on Metacritic. I mean, hey, congratulations to Larian Studios and all of this because Baldur's Gate 3 continues to roll along and we're coming up on that PS5 release. So, I guess look for a bunch of reviews to compiling in then, and if it's still sitting at a 96 or a 97, I mean, we might be looking at uh, the favorite for game of the year, and that is gonna be an interesting time in December for the Game Awards to see what games even get nominated in the first place. And before we go to the comment of the day, we're gonna take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday, where I ask, have you played Dino Crisis before? 69% say no. All right, 31% say yes. Look at that, plenty of people to try out Dino Crisis for the first time when Capcom is ready to do the collaboration with Exo Primal. Look, I think it would be really cool for Capcom to do something with Dino Crisis, specifically a remake, because that game could look really cool in RE Engine. And based on what I've seen in Exo Primal, they can do some pretty impressive stuff when it comes to number of dinosaurs even on screen if they want to go that route, but... Uh, it seems like they're all in, at least right now, for Exo Primal, especially doing crossovers with Street Fighter and, and other things. So I'd like to think there is a future where Dino Crisis could get that remake, but something tells me it's 
Not gonna be anytime soon. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from C Breezy. It says, for the most part, the Pokemon TCG rules are relatively the same. Yeah, there have been new types of cards introduced over the years. The meta is obviously different. Old cards have even seen new reprints with balance, rebalanced stats, but the baseline rules are more or less the same now as they were back then. I think the GBC game is still a great game to dive into and develop a basic understanding of how the TCG works in regards to energy, resource management, trainer cards, power hours. It teaches you how evolution works in the game. It teaches you how different and more simple the type advantage system is. Yeah, I, I mean, if the rules haven't changed much, sure, but some of those cards, the power creep is ridiculous. I mean, you see cards hitting for 100 points of damage all over the place, hundreds of points of HP or like on almost every card. Back in the day with Charizard, when, when, when you got that card in your hand, you're looking down at Charmeleon, you drop that, what was basically a god card at that time. It felt like it was over. I mean, really, Charizard had like, what, 120 HP and had an attack that did 100 damage. It just wasn't fair, right? So, and the Pokemon power basically turned every energy you put on it into a fire energy. So you just had Charizard and you're just annihilating everything in front of you over and over again. But just the power creep for some of those cards and the stats are ridiculous. I, maybe I'm just old and I like the simpler times when basically Charizard ruled over everything. Although, whenever I see these new sets come out, everyone just wants Charizard, so... Eh, maybe it's still kind of the same. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today was The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom with a bunch of patents going live. Do you think there should be a concern going forward as more and more patents are filed around different game mechanics in the industry? And then also, what about Sony seemingly going all in on game streaming? How do you think things will look for the PlayStation brand, say 10 or even 15 years from now? Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.